me in greeting uh, Dr. Yan Shui-Tong uh, in coming and gracing us in Riyadh and honoring us with his knowledge. He is the director of the Modern International Relations Institute and he is also supervises the Chinese magazine of international relationship from Oxford University. He has written and authored a lot about international relationships. And he tried to offer a Chinese perspective with regard to the, to the theories of international relations. He has an extensive experience on China. And this is an opportunity to us to Thank you. And uh, first, uh, let me uh, show my greatness and uh, to the Dr. Uh, Saud and uh, and also to the center, uh, the King Shafer's uh, uh, Center for Research and Islamic Studies. And this is my, okay, this is my very, very first trip to your great country. So uh, I'm really excited and uh, I'm looking for the anything new and <laughs> uh, different from China. And also, you know, in my mind, and this country are kind of a myth and very different from China. And so I want to see how different it is. But actually, and uh, through the uh, brief introduction and uh, through the uh, very brief contact with the people this afternoon, I find uh, we can find a lot of similarities between Chinese and uh, uh, Saudis. Rather than this difference, this uh, may be quite a superficial uh, difference uh, between our clothes. And actually, uh, I want to start it, uh, this talk from the two uh, secure, uh, strategies and uh, recently issued by the uh, Trump's administration. And uh, Trump <coughs> make, uh, make a state visit to China in no, uh, October of last year just within uh, uh, two months. And then the uh, Trump's administration issued the national security strategy, and the last week, the national defense st uh, strategy. These two strategies uh, identified China as the primary competitor to, uh, to the US, and uh, regard China as the most th uh, threatening and challenger to the U.S. security and uh, prosperity and even American values. So after these two uh, uh, reports, these two documents issued, I, th I think that there's a cause a lot of uh, fears about the coming competition between China and the U.S. And some people suppose and uh, the, the world will be dri uh, driven into a new Cold War. So the so-called, and uh, I mean in these uh, uh, two documents, the concerning China will challenge American dominant the uh, world order. So today, I want to spend some time about the world order. So what world order, ex the existing order is, and uh, what challenges the uh, existing order faced with, and uh, what kind of order we are going to, uh, to have, possibly. And uh, first, uh, I want to say, there's a, a kind of a, a mis uh, misunderstanding or kind of a, a misconception about the world international order and the international system. International order actually refers to a kind of the state of the international system. So the World the international system have never been changed since the end of the World War II, so-called Yalta system. And the nation states act as major international players. And the norms, mainly based on the UN Charter, and govern the, uh, uh, all of the international uh, uh, events. And also, and then we have this uh, <coughs> The, during the Cold War, we have a bipolar system. Now we have a, a, a unipolar system after the Cold War. Actually, this system 
except the change from the bipolar during the Cold War to the unipolar after Cold War, and the norms and the international actors are same. What is going to change in the next 10 years? And from my understanding, the international actors will remain the same. And I doubt we can see a lot of countries change their nature or the character. And China still be China, and Saudi Arabia still the Saudi Arabia. And the international actors still the same. International norms maybe change a little bit. I don't know how much. And uh, it's, we can discuss later. But uh, one thing is clear is that the American dominated unipolar uh, uh, configuration will change towards a bipolar system. And that's my personal view, and which is quite different from my government's view. My government concern the world is in the process of a multipolarization. But for me, I, th I cannot see any new superpowers will come except China. So in the visible uh, future, we are going to have uh, two superpowers instead of one, the US only, or instead of three, we have the China, US, and some country else. So if we are going to have uh, two superpowers within 10 years, then we will, people will ask, what kind of uh, international order we are going to have? OK, now we know the international configuration is going to change toward the bipolarization. But then whether the order will change before we know whether the present order will change or not, we need to understand what is order, what order we have now. And the first, I think the order can be divided or categorized into three levels. Order of the peace, order of the power, and the order of the norms. What do I mean order of the peace? Peace, order of peace refer a state of the system. For instance, today we have very good order in this room, people very quiet, and uh, people follow this uh, uh, custom and uh, to make not voice, and uh, our chairman set up a, a rule and that's normal for this uh, uh, discussion, and everyone silent their cell, uh, cellular phone, right? So these are norms. So you see, because everyone follows these uh, uh, norms, and then we have a very peaceful order. Let's suppose if someone carries a gun into the room, and they do not agree with each other, and then they shoot against each other, then what will happen? That means we're going to have a war. There's no order. So the first level of the international order is a peace or war. So if you look at what happened in the, uh, currently, and I think there's one thing is changing. And the American, I mean so since the end of the uh, Cold War, America is the country initiate most of the war in the world. But now it seems to me Trump administration becomes uh, reluctant to initiate new wars. Even you read these two strategies, and uh, I don't think uh, Mattis and the Trump, they want to initiate more wars. Look at uh, what happened to North Korea's nuclear issue. And uh, even the Trump administration and, uh, talked about the possible military solution of this issue, but uh, actually, since the uh, April of 22nd, and uh, the aircraft carrier, uh, Carol Vinson, didn't uh, move toward the, did not shape toward the uh, Korean Peninsula. And then we only heard about the danger, but actually nothing happened. That means, and the Trump is very cautious to initiate a real war. He did order the a launch missile against uh, Syria, but that is uh, only a small military clashes. It's not a war. So the war is escalated from the small military clashes rather than it's equal to the military 
uh, uh, crashes. What do I mean? I mean that in currently we find that the war did not seem to me to, the number of the wars do not increase very much, or almost maintain the same like what we experienced in last twenty years of, since the end of the uh, Cold War. So the order of the peace still the same. And later on, we can discuss whether that will change. At the middle of level is what is the order of the power. It's also called the redistribution of power. So what happened? Because the world is moving toward the unipolar system or transferred from the unipolar configuration to the bipolar configuration, so inevitably, the power redistribution will uh, occur. That means uh, the rising power, including China, will gain more international influence. Meanwhile, like the U.S., the uh, declining power, they will lose their influence. It's already happened. American influence has uh, 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 declined dramatically in the last year. So very recent show, I'm sorry, very recent the poll by the, um, not a poll, by the, the uh, uh, Gallup. But Gallup, Americans' uh, leadership welcomed the, work, the welcome to Americans' leadership declined from the, uh, more than 40% in the last year of the Obama to the 30% uh, 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 this year. And actually, the another poll did by the uh, Pew, and uh, even lower, is to the 22 uh, uh, second. So you see, the American influence, the decline of American influence or leadership is a reality. It's not uh, uh, in uh, any imagination. So what does it mean? It means that uh, the power redistribution has already occurred. It will continue. So the power, I mean the international power, will redistribute it according to the change. What change? The change in strength. The change in national comprehensive strength among the major powers. So in that way, from my understanding, the order of the power, it is under, is under the changing. So how about the norm, the normative order? The normative order have not changed very much, but do face the challenge. And uh, normative order, I think we have to make a, a clear distinction. Some American scholars argue that America established liberalist order after World War II. I think this is exaggerated. American spent efforts on established liberalist order since the end of World War II, but they have not achieved that goal until the end of the World War II. The uh, end of the Cold War. That means uh, the liberalist order was established from 1992. That is true. Americans' uh, liberalism dominated the uh, international norms for two decades. But now, this kind of liberalist uh, norms face a challenge. But uh, that's really funny. The challenge did not come from the developing countries. The challenge come from the developed countries. First, the country who challenged these norms is UK. UK withdrew from the EU, and the EU is regarded as the big achievements of liberalism. UK is regarded as the sample of the liberalist norms, and. Uh, when the UK uh, withdraw from the uh, decided to withdraw from the EU, and it's a, bring a big challenge to the liberalist order, and then the second challenge come from the US, and when Trump obtained the uh, win the election, becomes uh, the uh, American uh, president, he withdraw from the TPP, and. Uh, he reluctant to, to, to encourage freedom of uh, uh, free trade and start to advocating for 
fair trade. This is a fundamental change, change the norm of the world trade. That means from the free trade to fair trade. And Mewell and Trump also challenged, challenged the Americans' tradition about their relationship with their allies. And usually, Americans provide the uh, security protection for the allies without any financial requirements. But now, and Trump said that no, and Trump wants to have the equal relationship with the allies rather than the leadership with the allies. So what do you mean the eco? Eco means the financially, and the U.S. want to be eco with the major allies, and the allies should share more economic responsibility for this. So you see, now even these few days, people expected there could be a kind of a uh, unpleasant conversation between the Trump and the Macron, uh, the German uh, Chancellor. So. You find that the current liberalist norms facing the challenge not from developing countries, from developed countries. This is really ironic. Okay, now since we understand there's a order in three different levels, now we we can we should understand why these three levels of orders and facing this uh, 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 this kind of a Challenge, and the first, I want talking about the P, uh, the order of the peace. The order of the peace actually heavily fix uh, based on what, based on international leadership. You cannot expect it. The world has a peace without international leadership, and uh, just now, chairman and. Uh, did some advertisement for my book. <laughs> and uh, my book had been uh, criticized by some scholars for advocating for a hierarchical system. And uh, according to the Chinese uh, traditional thinking, order, I mean the peace, the order of the peace can only be based on hierarchical uh, uh, system. And you cannot expect the peace and for an anarchical system. For instance, and for why there's a more international conflicts, military conflicts, than the civil military clashes? Because the government monopolized military forces. And then and the government can use the military forces to maintain hierarchical system. That means that's the only way to prevent the civil war. And for China, we experienced a lot of civil wars in our history. The latest one is the 1930s of the last century. And we have several warlords. They all have their own troops. They all are equal to each other. And no, no one listens to anyone, just like what happened to Libya. So when everyone is equal to every, everyone, and without leadership, and you can never avoid the war, you can never have the real peace. So I do not mean that we are going to establish a world government, but we do need a, a leadership. Who can offer that kind of leadership? And someone suggested that, OK, we can offer collective leadership. This is a very good concept. Even collective leadership, the question is that, who have the resources to offer that kind of leadership? Leadership is not free. Leadership is very costly. Any country wants to provide the leadership for the community, no matter for the regional peace, or world peace, and that means money. That means you have to spend money for it. And uh, you can see that. And uh, uh, okay, people talking about the peace in the uh, Europe. Actually, that kind of peace is heavily based on uh, the joint leadership between the Germany and the U.S. or between the Germany 
and friends. So without leadership, you even you cannot have this kind of a regional peace. And in Middle East, from my understanding, no one can provide the regional leadership for this region. It's beyond the U.S. capability. That's why Trump administration want to get the troops out of this region. It's beyond the Russia's capability. Even Russia helped the Syrian government to win the war in the in that country, but I don't think that Russia has the capability to provide leadership for this region. Certainly, it's also beyond China's capability. So, if we look at this at the global level, and America is the only country have that kind of military capability to provide the leadership, but Trump do not want to continue that. Trump want to shape off this kind of responsibility. So, from my understanding, and a lot of country expect China to fill that a、uh, uh, vacuum. My understanding, the question is not whether China want to or not. The question is whether China has the capability or not. China do not have that kind of military resources. We don't have that kind of military capability. It's beyond China's capability to fill this vacuum of world leadership. So in the visible future, that. The possibly we are going to move in a new age, the new era, the term used in the uh, uh, American national defense system, the world without leadership. So without a real leadership, and、uh, I think some places, and will face more problem with the peace, and means、uh, not peace, the order of the peace. Okay, so the second is about the order of the power. The order of the power now is、uh, like these two、uh, strategies and、uh, identify China as the challenger to Americans'、uh, international status or Americans' power. I don't think it's chi China is prepared, scheduled, designed, planned to do that. This is a natural. This is the result of the bipolarization. The international society is an anarchical society. It's not like a domestic uh, 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 society. In domestic society, the central government or the national leaders have the power to give the power to the subordinates, to cadres, to ministers. To prime minister, to the prime minister, to ministers, and to local governors, but for international society, no country, no institution have that power to deliver the power to the to every country. Every country's international power increase or decline according to their own interests.、Uh, I'm sorry, their own strengths. If there be, becomes a stronger. The power will increase、uh, automatically, because the power is not given by anyone. So it's not China to challenge the U.S. It's not China try to take the power、uh, from the U.S. This is just a natural result, and China make the economy grow faster and narrow the power,、uh, narrow the strength uh, uh, disparity with the United States. So the China's international power increased, and because of Americans' relative decline, that means their strengths do not grow fast enough. So their international power is shrinking. So in that way, it's not only the the the、uh, strength gap between China and the U.S. change will、uh, driven the power redistribution. And also in every region, for instance, in East Asia, it's not China try to minimize or reduce Japan's international power, because of Japan's econ economic stagnation, that country's economy grows so slow, and so their relative strength is declining, so their international power goes with the decline of their national strength. It's not anyone take their their power away. 
So the same thing happened to the other regions. The third thing is about the norms. The order of a norm is a little bit complicated because the norm decided by two things. First, it's decided by the international mainstream value. That means uh, why during the Cold War, America cannot make the all of these norms and made agreed by, every, by most of the country according to the American's liberalism. Because during the Cold War, Soviet Union is uh, very strong, not only in terms of uh, military, and also because of what? The communist ideology. The communist ideology shared by many countries. These countries do not accept the norms guided by liberalism. After the Cold War, the East, Eastern Bloc collapsed, the Soviet Union collapsed, the Warsaw Pact collapsed, and then what? That means uh, the global, uh, I'm sorry, the uh, democratization and the marketization become so overwhelming over the world. And then more and more country and uh, change the ideology. So because most of the country accepted the liberalism, and then the liberalism become dominant mainstream value after 1991. So the new norms after the Cold War had actually established according to American liberalism. Now, the liberalism itself is declining. It's not only the U.S., not the strength, the idea. The liberalism faced the challenge from whom? From uh, American people themselves. And in the U.S., from understanding, and this so-called establishment is a kind of ideology. They think the liberalism has gone too far. And I don't know whether it's suitable to talk about this uh, issue in the U.S. And they even have problem for what? For toilet. And the people are get used to the toilet divided according to the gender for women and for uh, gentlemen. In the U.S., because this liberalism go to the extreme, and then what? And these uh, uh, homo uh, homosexual people, and they ask for establish a special toilet for them, mutual, without gender. And then these are certainly welcomed by gays and uh, lesbians, but then it was opposed by whom? By the conservative people, or by the, and from as mainly for the ancient uh, immigrants. And they said that we take our children to the public place, and then we don't know how to educate our children. We don't know which toilet they should go. If the kid said, hey, why, you see, that, uh, that man go to this uh, so-called uh, third gender uh, uh, toilet, and why I cannot. So these kind of things that become uh, too extreme cause a domestic ideological conflicts in the United States, not in the other countries. So the liberalism faces the challenge from the domestic uh, values. Uh, I'm sorry, from the Western uh, uh, societies. And these cause the, the people, uh, no, I'm sorry, undermine the base of the liberalist norms. Okay, the second factor. The fact, second factor has a strong impact on international norm is what? Is the, the, uh, 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 the, the power within the international institution. You see, the international institution, no matter UNESCO or the UN or the World Bank, and every country possesses some power, right? So that's the norms decided which kind of ideology or the peop, uh, a group and have a more votes. Now, a U.S. found that 
they cannot get more votes within the in current international organizations. And so they try to withdraw. Trump has already made a decision to quit from UNESCO and quit from the uh, Paris uh, agreements and uh, abandon the TPP and also quit from, I forgot, another international organizations. And then what? Then the power structure within the international organization is changing. This kind of change will definitely will have influence on establishing new international norms. So you see, now we find that the order at the three domains, and uh, peace, and uh, power, and uh, norms, are all changing according with the change of the power uh, uh, strength structure among the major powers among the uh, among the people okay so the lesser part i want to talk about what kind of uh, order we are going to have this is uh, i think uh, every, uh, uh, everyone concerned about i think first we have to make the distinction between the global order and the regional order. Global order is a combination of the regional order, but it doesn't mean the global every region have the same order in consistent with the global order. That's a very different. And from my understanding, globalization becomes a very, very strong. And how strong, from my understanding, is almost beyond human beings' capability to resist it. There's a misunderstanding to believe globalization is something good. And actually, globalization is a double sword, has two edges, both positive and negative uh, influence. We certainly notice that free trade, free investment, free move of the laborers, and these are positive things. And those, we always want to ignore the negative part. Terrorists move freely. Terrorism globalized. Disease globalized. Pollution globalized. Smuggling globalized. And so many, many negative things are also globalized. Globalization actually bring two very serious, uh, I'm sorry, not two, uh, bring a one a very serious social impact on us. I mean, it's negative. What was it? It's a polarization. Polarization has caused both domestic conflicts and international conflicts. In China, we certainly happy we host the G20. And you, if you read the newspaper and this reports, always proud of they say that. Look at that. G20 accounts for 80%, more than 80% of the GDP. Wait a minute. If this small group of country accounts for 80, more than 80% of GDP, how about the other 560 countries? The other 160 countries accounts for only 20%, less than 20%. So the globalization at the international level becomes worse and worse. I don't think we can stop it. And you find that these major economies or the members of the G20s, they have their economy grow faster than the non-G20 countries, right? So how can you stop the globalization, uh, uh, polarization? Second, domestically, the domestic polarization also becomes worse and worse. Not only in developing countries, the same in developed countries, in US, in Japan, in Europe. That's why the Europe has become the decentralized. This is a problem. And I don't think any government will stop it. So that's why now we call for global governance. Global governance doesn't mean that we make the world better. 
global governance means we prevent the world getting worse. I don't think the global governance can make the world better. If the global governance can prevent the world getting worse, that's already good enough. What do I mean governance? We do not need to govern something good. We need to govern something bad. We govern something hurt the people, right? So in that way, we can understand that Americans try to quit from the global governance. Americans do not want to undertake the responsibility for that because they're very costly. Who, who can undertake this leadership? I don't know. And from my understanding, that requires a collective uh, wisdom, collective uh, efforts to find a way to, uh, uh, to carry out it. So concerning this uh, global, so you find that the global order and it's uh, in a way and not move in a positive uh, direction is not because and China becomes stronger. It's not because of the bipolarization. It's because what? Because the next, mainly the negative parts of globalization. And it's beyond our human beings' capability to stop it at this moment. OK, let's look at the regional order. Every region has different orders. And from my understanding, for this region, I mean the Middle East, for this region, main problem is not that the second and third uh, domain, not the power redistribution, is not an uh, order of a normative order, is the order of the peace. How to resume the order in this region is a big issue. I don't know. I think most of you expert on uh, Middle East issues. I'm not an expert on that. But from my understanding that, extra, the new situation is that the external power is going to have a less and less influence on this region rather than uh, increase. We cannot expect US, Russia, or China to play more role in this region's security. And that this, region's, this re region's security will more and more rely on the regional power your country, and Turkey, and uh, uh, Iran, and uh, 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 Egypt. And uh, I think these regional major powers will play more role for the regional security. So this will be different from the Cold War. And when the US and the Soviet plays a major role in this region, and also different from the uh, uh, post-Cold War, when the US plays a major role in this region. So how can you have these uh, regional major powers and to work together to establish a security architecture for this region, to establish uh, a new order of the power redistribution and uh, new norms for the governing the uh, regional peace? I don't know. I think that's your target. OK, come to the, uh, uh, the order in the East Asia, very different. The North Korea's nuclear issue make many people feel and East Asia is a very dangerous region. And uh, this region and has a danger to fall into war. My personal understanding, that's not reality. This country is one of the most peaceful regions in the world since 1991, when the Cambodian War ended. This region has no war for more than 30 years, right? Since 19, after 1991, there's no any war. Even the Europe, most of people believe that most of the peaceful region, that region has experienced the four wars. The war in Kosovo, Chechnya, and the Chechen, and the uh, 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 Ukraine. In this region, East Asia, there's never been war since the 1992. And from my understanding, this situation will continue. It's not because North Korea developed the nuclear weapons, there will be a danger of war. And there will be a danger of uh, what the conflicts, but no war. 
Since the end of the Korean War in 1953, and in the last seven decades, the military conflicts between the South Korea and North Korea never stop, but none of them escalated into war. And if these two guys can maintain the peace, but with small scale of military conflicts for seven decades, why they cannot maintain that situation after North Korea possessed nuclear capabilities? And if you look at the situation between the India and the Pakistan, after the both sides possess nuclear weapons, they, they continue the military conflicts between them. They shoot each other and the fire gun, uh, uh, cannon, and then what? And then the military clashes and it becomes a much smaller in scale than what they experienced before the process of nuclear weapons. So my argument is that for East Asia, the outer issue is not peace. The outer issue is power. That means the power distribution in this region will cause a lot of conflicts. Japan is unhappy to see and they are losing their international influence, and losing their influence in this region. Japan used to be the second largest world economy, now becomes the third. And the, but their influence and become faster than their economic size. And Japan used to be the largest importer of the East Asian countries. But now, it's no longer that. And so from my understanding, in this region, Japan and the US are all worried about, and the China's power increased too fast, and their influence declined too, far, uh, uh, too much. So this will cause a lot of conflicts among the major powers in this region. Certainly, also, there's uh, 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 secondary countries, like the members of ASEAN countries, and uh, they really worry about the relationship between China and the U.S., I mean, say, the competition between China and the U.S. And so for them, they feel that is a really a difficult situation. But from my understanding, no matter they like it or not, the competition between China is a reality. The bipolarization is a very serious, develop very fast in that region. It, these uh, certain countries have to adjust their strategy to dealing with this situation. And not only them, China and the US also have to adjust their strategy. Well, at the very beginning I said that, US already adjusted the strategy and toward the China. And um, from my understanding, the, my understanding this since uh, uh, the second part of the uh, second term of the uh, Clinton and uh, American government the first time and uh, identified China as a rival or use the term rival to describe China. And uh, okay, so I'm going to uh, end this in uh, uh, one minute. Okay, the f last thing is uh, about the uh, the uh, uh, regional order in Europe. The European order is what? It's about a, norm, a normative, normative one. That means uh, what a kind of a norm the European is going to establish. Obviously, and uh, the decentralization of the EU is a trend. And the integration of the EU has stopped. And so I think uh, that German and France face a new challenge from this kind of a decentralization of the Europe. And um, my understanding, the, the traditional EU norms can no longer govern the relationship among the EU members, and especially like these East European countries. So they require for a new norms to govern the EU and uh, their relationship with the rest of the world. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much.
Thank you very much, Dr. Yan, for a very insightful and sober talk. And um, the typology that you've set up on the distribution of power, the order of peace, and the normative order is a very good way of looking at the international system. Um, now we would like to open the floor to questions. Um, I would ask everyone to keep their comments brief or their questions and also to introduce themselves beforehand. Um, My name is Maqdad. I received this uh, prize uh, uh, since a long time. Okay, one, two, three. I'd like to thank King Faisal International Foundation, our uh, foundation for providing us this opportunity from, uh, from scholars from different countries that we could learn a lot from them. And I would like to thank the speaker. Uh, these informative ideas, uh, the diverse ideas, and I think I can propose some suggestions for some. My appreciation for this talk and for this foundation uh, this is the start but with regard to my suggestions I think there are uh, talks that about China that should be increased and we need to have more and we should talk about the rise and the fall of countries and people and since we are looking uh, uh, and I am going to look about China more, and I'm uh, because we are going to see the economic growth, the uh, rise of and the growth of the economy in China, and how that made and make that China to become a world power and to rise swiftly. We want more talks from this speaker and other Chinese speakers to talk about that. Thank you for your uh, uh, suggestions. You can uh, give us these uh, suggestions later on. The most important thing uh, to, uh, to provide us with more talks about China. And, and, uh, the Asian unit will provide more talks about China. Uh, good evening, uh, Dr. Yan. My name is Majid al -Asiri. I'm a political science student. Uh, I wanted to ask, uh, from your own perspective, uh, what will we see from the future role or the future ideology of China? Will you see it like uh, the yes. Confucius? Uh, uh, style that was in the imp empire of Xing, uh, if I presume correctly, or we will see it more into the ideological role of Marxism, mm -hmm. which was uh, <laughs> a very big role in yes. uh, its movement toward uh, uh, the modernism. Yeah. Uh, my <laughs> other question is, uh, uh, from your own perspective, you criticized the hierarchical, uh, you advocated for a hierarchical system. Uh, can we consider the single polar uh, that was established by the United States as a, a single polar situation where they possessed the hierarchical situation where they dominated their uh, liberalism ideologies? Uh, at the same time, I cannot consider it as an ideology. I consider it as a uh, realism. They possess their own uh, mutual benefit. They pr uh, change, the, let us say, the countries according to their own uh, perspective which is uh, obviously from the perspective of uh, Russia. Uh, Putin considers it to be very harmful for their uh, conservative situation, as well as from my, uh, my own understanding to this uh, lecture, from China perspective as well. Thank you. Yeah, thank you so much for your questions. Maybe we can take one more question. Um, are there any questions from the female audience? Min al-Jumhur Nisa'i. My name is 
is Dr. Malkawi, Professor of Political and Strategic Science at Knife University Security uh, University Security Science University. We we teach the foreign policy of China, and I visited more than uh, many times. I visited China, but when uh, the conference of the Chinese Communist Party 18th conference was held, and the People's, the 13th People's Assembly. China began to have a new diplomacy, which was called the New Chinese Diplomacy, which was built on love and honesty and, and ethics and benefits. In politics, these do not exist because there are no uh, charity and uh, 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 politics is interest how China can deal with the, uh, with the competition for interest in this changing international order. The second question with regard to the polarism. We used to say that we have, when we have bipolar system and then unipolar system, I would say that we are now witnessing a short period of having multiple polars. But in the second half of the 21st century, there is a new stage, a very serious stage, which is the lack of polarity. How China can deal with this big change in the international order? And my last question, why China consider itself as a developing country? When we teach about China, we teach it as a major country or as a big country. Uh, uh, very interesting questions and uh, also seem to me uh, people have a lot of uh, uh, understanding about China's uh, uh, specialty. And the first, and uh, I have uh, uh, the question is uh, uh, related to about uh, China's uh, uh, economic growth. I'm not an economist. I cannot uh, offer any kind of economic explanation how China's economy maintained a high uh, growth. But uh, I, for, as a political scientist, I would uh, uh, give you a political explanation. My understanding, China's uh, economic growth and based on the communist leadership, that this leadership and uh, provide a capable what the le uh, lead uh, uh, capable leadership for what for reform. And uh, since 1978, our government carried the most reform than any country. With the, the reform in terms of the size, scope, and the, uh, in terms of the uh, deepness, and I don't think you can find any country and uh, uh, carried out like that. And the, let me take an example. If you go to, I don't know, means there's buildings, there's cell phones, and if you ask the people about uh, what they did at, uh, uh, at the uh, primary school, you can find that the primary schools, the textbook in, in, my, uh, uh, in, 19, uh, in 1980s are very different from what they used today in the uh, primary school. So they do not, if you ask the people what changed on the university, not only they change the, the buildings, the chairs, the facilities for the uh, uh, class, they change the textbooks, they change the way of the teaching, and they change everything. We even changed what you cannot imagine. We reformed several times the grading system. How do you grade the students' homework? I doubt any country reform the grading system so frequently. So China can keep the econ economy grow faster than uh, most of countries, from mainly because the government strongly, determinedly, and resists on the principle of the reform. That's the uh, reason. And uh, second, about the question ideology. I think this is a very good question. And uh, people ask me, and what kind of ideology China can provide for the world? My answer is very simple. I don't know. The reason is that in China, there are three ideologies competing against each other. The Marxism, traditionalism, 
that means a tra China's a traditional culture, and then what a economical practicing. So these three tradition we call it the the uh, tradition the old oldest tradition is a Chinese traditional value, and most of the foreigners uh, believe it is a Confucianism, or it is more co complicated than that. And the second is a communist tradition, this from the 1949, and then it's a new tradition from 1975, the policy of the reform and the opening up. So these three ideologies competing each other. So you find that even our government, we use a Marxism to govern our society, but we never see we use Marxism to guide our foreign policy. In our official documents, we only say we use the Chinese trad uh, excellent uh, traditional uh, uh, value to guide our foreign policy. So these things is uh, still difficult for China to provide a, a kind of ideology and for the whole world. Okay, that's not our tradition. And uh, also, uh, uh, not the Chinese government's uh, 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 motivation to provide a Chinese uh, traditional value to replace liberalism. No, I don't think the uh, Chinese government and want to do that. According to my uh, understanding, our Chinese uh, traditional political thought, China should not. China should not to concern to provide a kind of value for the whole world, the whole world because we encourage the diversity of uh, values, diversity of the culture, diversity of the ideology. And for Confucianism, and uh, as uh, my theory, and uh, we argue that, and, the China, and uh, for the good leadership, good leadership never to force others or seduce others to change their thought, their thinking. Good leadership set up a model for others, let others to f imitate them, to, to learn from them by their own will. So Confucius once said, and he's a teacher just like me, he's a professor, he said, As a professor, you should never go to teaching students at their home. As a professor, you have to wait, stay there, wait the student come to learn from you. Why? That means that if the students come to you, your home to learn, that means that they are willing to. If you go to the student's home to teach them, that means you force them to learn. You force them to change their thought. When a country, when a, anyone tries to change others' belief, change others' thinking, and the modern term, that's uh, imperialism. <laughs> that's why, and uh, according to the Chinese traditional value, China should not have that kind of thinking and to expand our own uh, ideology. And also we have that experience in 1950s. When we follow the Soviet Union's model, try to spread the communism to the other countries, then what? It causes more disasters more conflicts, more military uh, 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 clashes, rather than harmony, rather than friendship, and no cooperation. The third question about, is about the China's uh, uh, new diplomacy. I think that's what in Chinese term, we call it a Wang Dao. And also in the modern Chinese term, uh, modern English, is the human authority. And you see these two terms. First, uh, humane. The second is authority. Authority is a very different from what? From the power. And authority is a represent, I use a, 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 a analogy. And authority represented by what? By doctor, medical doctor. And the patients follow the doctor. It's not because the doctor is powerful, because he believes in the doctor. And the power represented by police. Police can force all the pedestrians and the drivers to stop. By what? By their force. So good leadership 
should be established its authority. It's not established its power. So, so this when someone said use ethic, ethic leadership, actually we call it a moral leadership. So morality should be, and the base for China's uh, leadership. And I don't mean China already practice the, uh, its uh, uh, its influence in a very good way. That's what I suggest we should. And the, and also related to this, what can, how China to shape the world order? I don't think China should to shape the world and according to our will. We should shape the world by our own model. If we can set up a good model at home, I firmly believe many countries will follow China's uh, uh, model. And uh, uh, just like uh, American can establish the liberalist order, it's not because based on their military force after the Cold War, but based on based on Americans' achievements at home. So the same, and I think China and should shape the world order by working hard at home rather than to work hard uh, abroad. And the final thing is about. Uh, uh, oh, why China identify itself like a developing country? <laughs> this is a very good question. And um, nowadays, uh, China no longer use the term uh, developing country and uh, 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 referring to economic uh, uh, issue or economic status. It refers to a political status. Developing country means these country are unhappy with uh, the current uh, world order and being dominated by the Western countries. They want to establish a new order and to make uh, developing countries enjoy more power and enjoy more equity. So from my understanding, the developing country, this uh, phrase, no longer have uh, any concept uh, economic. Uh, uh, when China identifies itself as a developing country, it's no longer uh, uh, in economic uh, concept but in political concept. Thank you. Um, we'll collect another batch of questions now, although I'd like to just ask you maybe a question. I'll sure. assume, assume my prerogatives as chairman of this lecture, which is that for, you were talking about um, the fact that moral authority is attained primarily through the exercise of morals, and that's how people come and are attracted to this model thereof. But it seems that Shunzi, as far from what I understand from reading your work and other works, he has a very fundamentally negative view of human nature, as mm -hmm. opposed to Mengzi, who represents the dominant mainstream in Confucius. Opposite. Yeah. And he sees, therefore, that there is a role for rectification, for education, and even the attainment of the Wang Dao, sort of the, yeah. the humane or kingly way. Yeah. It requires still force with it. Yes. You know, otherwise, it would be a very vacuum. Uh, a very weak type of moral authority yeah. that can easily disappear. So I think maybe you would argue mate, perhaps that then therefore the state can actually domestically focus on China and cultivate this moral authority through rectification education. But even spreading it globally would still require an exercise of power. Yes. So you'd see that that would be the case. Yes. Well. Yeah. I'll, uh, uh, answer your question? Uh, maybe we can take, uh, okay, sure. perhaps, I don't want to dominate it. Uh, perhaps the person in the back over there. Uh, my name is Engineer Majid. Uh, my name is Engineer Majid. I'm a civil engineer and uh, I'd like to thank Officer Yan for his uh, excellent presentation. My question, you mentioned uh, the uh, global governors, and this governors has to be there is a mechanism has to be fined in order to refer to. This is one issue. I think there is a sustainable development goals agreed by the whole states in the world. So this sustainable development goals that's adopted by the UN for span period of 15 years can be used as a basis for global governance by the G20 as a leading group. This is one issue. 
The second issue, I'm talking about the food security and water scarcity. And from the latest statistics that the water supply and the water demand for irrigation, that counts for 85 percent. From 2000 till 2050, there is a surplus in the supply and the equilibrium will be expected at 2025. In 2050, there is a gap accounts for 1,250 billion cubic meter in the whole world. This is one issue. Second issue is the soil degradation because of the desertification. And the UN already announced 2015 at the soil, uh, the year soil, uh, the, the world soil year. And the food needed for the world expected at 2050 with a population of 9 billion, it has to be doubled since the humanity of 10,000 years, they start harvesting. This is the expected needed. So, as an example, your country and India, you have five rivers. And we are expecting, according to this background, war conflicts will be break out in the whole world because of the water scarcity. So I need your comments for that and for the food security. Thank you. Perhaps uh, we can take two more questions. Um, um, General Secretary, uh, uh, can you give him the? And then we'll take a question from over there. And thank you, Professor Ryan, for this very informative uh, lecture. And I have uh, a question. In, uh, in your view, where do you see India, and this is changing world order? Thank you. Okay. Um, maybe we'll take one last question. Oh, I see. Um, Lady over there. Uh, uh, محاضرة ممتعة. Hello. محاضرة ممتعة جعلتني أتساءل عن فيصل. ما الذي يجعل سياسة الحكومة الصينية تختلف عن السياسة الأمريكية من ناحية التطلع للهيمنة العالمية أو كونها قوة عظمى؟ وإن تغير الترتيب العالمي يوما فهل سيتغير العالم من أحادي أمريكي إلى أحادي صيني؟ علما بأن الصين ليست أفضل من أمريكا في الملفات الإنسانية وهل سنستمر في ترك القوى الاقتصادية تكون الحكم في من سيكون الأقوى التالي؟ وإذا كانت المشكلة بنظركم في الأيديولوجية الأمريكية أو الليبرالية وانتشارها فهل عندما تصبح الصين قوة عظمى ستصبح الماركسية أو الشيوعية مشكلة أيضا؟ شكرا Do you have the capacity to take one more question? Or? Okay, how many minutes do we left? We have 10 minutes 10 minutes, okay Okay, I have four questions and I have 10 minutes so uh, Divided them for each, so two and a half for each. And first, I have to say, I'm the disciple of Xunzi. I am not the disciple of the uh, Mengshers. In some way, I like Xunzi's arguments against the Meng, uh, Mengshers. <laughs> Mengshers believe that the human being and uh, actually uh, have a kind of a good uh, uh, the DNA. So the human being can learn uh, 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 the morality and behave morally because uh, they were born with a uh, uh, benign DNA. But then for Xunzi said, no, 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 all the human beings just like animal, we are the same. And uh, we are from the, as an animal, we are no different from the uh, other animals. We like good sound, good food, and uh, 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 beautiful uh, uh, women, but, and that because uh, uh, we are different from the animals. Human being differs from animal. It's not because uh, 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 by nature, 
by、uh, physically, but by what? By brain. By the we can learn. We have this capability to learn social norms. So,、uh, my argument that、uh, agree、uh, I agree with Xunzi, and、uh, because he analyzed the international relations from a、uh, two perspective, both the negative, the human nature, and the positive part of the social norms. So, since we can, the, the question related to you, and、uh, what kind of、uh, leadership? And the moral leadership China can offer to the world is not only based on China's good will or good uh, 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 traditional value, but also based on China's strengths. That means that only when you have the strengths, and then you can become the model for others. If you don't have the strengths, you can never be a model for others. In the class, you can you can find that all of the students with a high grade and have more influence than students have a low grade. And in China, we have a story is that the the girl at the the、uh, east bank of the river and uh, uh, is uh, not as beautiful as the girl on the western bank of the river. So the Girl on the east bank always、uh, imitate the girl on the west bank just because that girl is more beautiful than her. Now you look at the world; most of countries imitate Americans' model, and most、uh, uh, women imitate the model on the show. And、uh, the student, the the the, the、uh, poor students, and imitate the、uh, the good students. The same thing, and、uh, in the society. So that's why I argue that. And for China, we cannot、uh, expect it. And if we behave well, the others will uh, uh, follow us. We behave so well, but if we failed, if we cannot make China strong enough, I don't think any country will follow China. And they say, "Look at that! This guy is silly. He becomes so morally, he undermine that country." Because he is so moral, he can never make that country rich. He can never make that country strong. He can never make that country being respected by others, right? So that means the two factors and、uh, determines the leadership. First is the strength as a material basis, and then is the morality and the increase uh, 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 make the uh, leadership uh, attractive. So that's the、uh, first question to you: the relationship between the force and the morality. The second question about a sustainable growth, and actually, my understanding, the sustainable growth is based on the government policy. It's not based on the global governance. I don't think the global governance can make if the global governance have that kind of a, a, a function. And you cannot never tell why, with the same poor global governance, some country can maintain durable growth, but some country cannot. No matter the existing global governance is good or bad, why, under the same condition of the same global governance, some country can maintain the sustainable growth, some countries not. So, from my understanding, global sustainable grow,、uh, growth and based on government. Policy and the government policy is based on the government leadership. The leadership is the, the core of the leadership is how much they can reform their policy according to the change of the environment, according to their specific reality of this country. Concerning the water issue, actually, it's not only the shortage of water supply may cause a major crisis. Anything can cause mental clashes, and if you go to the street, you can find some young guys, and they like to fight with others for anything. And some young people, they behave so well, no matter what happened, they never fight against each other. So why do human beings go to the war for man's sake? It's not because of objective、uh, reason. It's mainly because of the. Subjective concern.
accept the, its mentality. And whether they prefer to settle down the disputes with the force, or they prefer to settle down the conflicts through the negotiation. The two approaches can achieve the same result. The, that is the leadership preference. So in my theory, so-called moral realism, I argue that the leadership strategic preference determines everything. And for instance, for, let's take the US for example. And uh, for Obama and, the, and the, 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 uh, Trump, they face the same problem with Americans decline of their trade status. America is no longer the world's largest trader. How can resume Americans that trading status? Obama preferred to establish a TPP. And Trump preferred and trade protectionism. So you see, same problem, they can use a different strategy to deal with. And from my understanding, the war, now people are always concern the border disputes is the cause of war. My understanding, border disputes is the excuse for war. It's not the reason for war. When the country wants to fight a war, and they use the border disputes as the excuse. Otherwise, you cannot explain why the border disputes sometimes exist for hundred, even thousand years. Sometimes there's a war, sometimes not. So the border disputes, even the border disputes, and can be used as an excuse for war. So the water conflicts the same. And now, if the leaders prefer to have a war or to settle down disputes with others through the war, they can fight the war with any excuse. So we never forget that. And uh, when the Bush 43 launched war against uh, Iraq, and based on the alleged uh, uh, massive uh, the weapons of mass destruction, right? So that's it's a, the, 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 how can we settle down these uh, disputes, or the water disputes? For man said, that depends on the leader's preference rather than the, uh, uh, the global governance. And uh, the third question is about uh, the India. And uh, I think the Indian's economy grow uh, really uh, 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 very uh, uh, desirable for this country. But uh, from my understanding, and uh, this country has uh, more problems than uh, most of people uh, can imagine, and uh, I didn't visit that, that country, uh, visit that country very often. But in the last few years, I visited the country three uh, times, and uh, almost uh, once a year. I find that this country is probably that it's not open enough, and th that's a very democratic country, but they are not very open, and they even constrain the McDonald. That means that they do not allow McDonald to open too much shops in one city. They only allow them to open very few shops. And that they do not allow foreigners to process estate. And you, foreigners can only rent. I visited one of the Indian's university. I found that uh, there's no foreign professors. I asked them why. And why, I said, why you don't hire the foreign professors? They said, OK, we can teach everything. Why we have foreigners? So you see, this kind of a mentality is a very, very different, at least different from Chinese. We don't believe Chinese know everything. We believe a foreigner always knows something we don't know. So Confucius has a very famous saying. He said that when there's a three persons get together, there must be one know something you don't know. When three people stand together, one of them must know something and was to be your teacher. <laughs> if you go to the, his hometown in Shandong province, I was shocked by that. In the street, if you ask anyone, even the bicycle uh, 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 figure for a direction, they call them a, Mr. Hey, I said, a teacher. They call him teacher. 
I said, wait a minute. I said, how can you call a worker a teacher? They said, because you learn from him about the knowledge, how to get to the place you want to go. <laughs> he has the knowledge to know where that place is. That's called knowledge. So that's why they call the teacher. In my hometown, we never <laughs> you, you go to the street and ask me, hey, teacher, <laughs> can you tell me how to get to the, smart, uh, the supermarket? So you see, that's their tradition. So my understanding that, and Indian is not open enough. They still try to, uh, they are kind of fear about the foreign uh, uh, intrusion. So my understanding, Indian certainly will play some role. Uh, uh, the role is uh, increasing, but it seems to me it's still a regional power. Indian plays a more role in the Southeast Asia, but uh, it's at, at least the invisible future, or at next uh, 10 years, it's still hard to, to see the Indian play an important role on any global issues. Uh, I think uh, it still takes, uh, in, it is about uh, and how different China will be from the US if someday China becomes a solo superpower. First, I will say, I don't think that day will come very soon. <laughs> you, you should know Chinese GDP is still only two-thirds of the U.S. That means at least it will take China another um, uh, 10 years or seven years to catch up with the U.S. in terms of the uh, size of the uh, GDP. And in terms of military, it may take a longer time for China to catch up. America have 11 aircraft carriers. We only have one. <laughs> we are going to build another two more, but even that is still far. The motor gap is too large. So for my understanding, it may take China at least 15 years to, 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 to narrow the substantially narrow the uh, motor gap with the US. So in that way, I think in 10 years at least, and I think uh, in 20 years, I don't think China will become a, a, a superpower. It's not that I don't have a confidence in my, my own country. It's that uh, I don't think Americans will decline that fast. <laughs> Except that uh, Trump, like Gorbachev, and uh, collapse the Soviet, uh, United States, <laughs> that will become the superpower, a sort of superpower. Otherwise, U.S. can maintain the superpower for another 20 years, no problem. Second, even China becomes a superpower, I don't think China will offer the uh, same inter uh, international leadership like U.S. The reason is that China has a different uh, traditional, uh, uh, traditional value. And uh, nowadays in academic uh, uh, community, and people already studied why when China was a superpower for so long time in East Asia, but China just established a tributary system, and China never colonized neighbors. This is strange. China has that kind of a military capability to colonize all these countries. But why China prefer to, what, to establish a vassal system, to let these countries have their own kings, and just uh, based on their own uh, 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 system to not election, and the, 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 their own their kings, and then to give them an established relationship and is that, okay, I'm an elder brother, you should show respect to me, and I will provide security protection for you. That's a so-called tributary system. As a leader, but do not colonize, colonize them. But if you can look at the European tradition, they colonize the other countries, right? So I think the Chinese tradition and the Chinese culture is different about what mean leadership. Leadership, means that you get respect from others. Leadership do not mean you can force others to do something. Leadership, and just like a teacher, you enjoy your students follow you. You are not leadership. It's not a please. You force people <laughs> to follow you. That's different. And uh, the 
uh, I think that's it. And so the final thing is about I want to have another unipolar world. I will say no, we cannot. This is a coming bipolar system, very possibly, and the last as long as what we experienced during the Cold War. We must remember the Cold War lasted for four decades, and so the coming bipolar uh, system may last uh, for several decades. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Please join me in thanking Dr. Yan. Thank you so much for joining us this evening. Um, this concludes the second lecture in our Sino-Saudi cultural series for this month. Uh, we will be having another public lecture on the 29th of January. I hope to see everyone in attendance there. And again, please join me again in thanking Dr. Yan and have a good evening.